Well, as we jump back into uh, pain management part two, and maybe you're thinking more pain management, like come on. But this illustrates the tension in our lives, doesn't it? It's like, do we really want to talk about pain? But, but pain is this reality. And pain often is an excruciating experience for us. We go through these types of experience that you just saw in the video, and it generates such a deep pain that starts impacting our lives at so many different levels. Now, you may be asking yourself, if you've been a part of this pain management series, you know, how does this apply to my life? Uh, maybe some of us this morning, we say, uh, you know, real addiction, as AA puts it, real addiction is my experience. And so these steps of recovery, uh, they are like my lifeline. Others of us this morning go, real addiction, not so much. Uh, soft addiction, culturally relevant addiction, okay, I can see how that applies to me. But maybe you ask yourself the question, uh, what do I do about this? And where is, where is that line in pain management that crosses from, from dealing with my pain in, in healthy kinds of ways? And where is that pain management that becomes actually more pain? Good morning. Is, Is that, that better? better? There we go. <laughs> now I can relax. It's like, man, that, that has so much volume. Uh, and so that's the, that's the tension that we face. How do we manage pain in our lives in such a way that it doesn't add more pain to my life? And then we ask the question, uh, where is that line? Where is that line between dealing with pain in, in healthy kinds of ways? Where is that other side where actually my attempts to manage pain in my life are very unhealthy and really are adding more pain to my experience. I love how Brene Brown puts this because she puts this whole thing of pain management into context when she says this. She says that it's not so much what you do as why you do it that makes the difference. It's why you do it, not what you do, that makes a difference. Certainly there are things that we can do that are destructive things, but a lot of times when it comes to pain management and the things that we turn to to kind of soothe ourselves and comfort ourselves, uh, that there are these unhealthy sorts of things in our lives. And so why do you do what you do? And for instance, you know, you can, you can have, and sorry to those of you, you know, on, on keto here, but you can have this absolutely amazing slice of chocolate cake. And it is just like the cap to a wonderful meal. It's just like that was absolutely delicious. But then you can cram a chocolate bar in your mouth, not even tasting it, in your frantic attempt to try and soothe yourself and deal with what's going down deep inside of you. Now, as we come to this fifth step of, of recovery this morning, you know, you saw it uh, printed at the end of the video, but as you come to this, this fifth step, which says voluntarily submit to any and all changes God wants to make in my life and humbly ask him to remove my character defects, or in the words of Jesus, uh, where we read, happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. We really need to stop and we need to recognize that there's um, this dangerous assumption that we can make. And the assumption is this, do we really want to change? Uh, here are these steps to recovery. Here is this pathway that you and I can go down to say, oh, I can deal with things in a healthy way in my life. But the question is this, do you really want to change? Do you really want transformation? Can you honestly answer that question? Yes. And really the, the tragedy of the tension here played out in the opening song this morning that the band did such a fantastic job on, Amy Winehouse, right? Rehab. And here's, you know, if you watch the bio on Amy Winehouse, here's the tragedy of this young woman's life of going, here's my demons, if you will. Here's what I struggle with. What's the solution? What's the pathway going to be that can help me 
deal with the pain of my life in effective, healthy kinds of ways. And yet the tragedy of Amy Winehouse's life was actually played out in her song, right? It's like, here's the solution. No, no, no. Here's the question. Do you really want to change? Do you really want to access these steps and this pathway to lead to growth and transformation in your life? Can you answer that question with yes? And I have this, this powerful experience right out of the life of Jesus that I want you to look at with me this morning. And, and this is what happens. It's just an amazing encounter. Uh, we read, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Now this is very interesting because it was party time in Jerusalem. There's like this incredible contrast being painted here. It was party time in Jerusalem. There was this festival, one of these great festivals that the people of Israel would have celebrated. And maybe you can compare it in some ways to, you know, Christmas or Easter on our calendar because there's this expectation. There's people coming together. There's celebration. But it's kind of like the camera, you know, pans over here to this small corner that's kind of at the side of the party. And you go through, as it says, the sheep gate. Um, you don't really want to go through the sheep gate. Like the sheep gate's not the people gate. The sheep gate's kind of stinky. And you go through this sheep gate. I mean, that's how, you know, you identify where this pool is. And you come around this pool, and it's not a pool party. Right? This isn't the spa at Chateau Whistler. This isn't the club med. In this cultural moment, this is a gathering of the hopeless and the desperate and the dependent. And the reason all these people are surrounding this pool, you know, that are invalids, that are paralyzed, that are blind, that are lame, the reason that they're there is that it was thought that this pool, these waters, they didn't just sort of have healing properties, you know, like we may say, hey, why don't, why don't we go to the spa? Why don't we go to a hot spring? You know, why don't you, why don't you put Epsom salts in your bath because it'll, it'll help your joints. It's like a whole other level because there was this legend. And when the waters would stir, it was said that an angel was actually stirring the waters. And if you could be, you know, get to the front of the line, and if you could be the first person in the pool, then you would be healed. And so here we have this guy. This guy we read has been an invalid for 38 years. I mean, maybe that's been his whole life. We don't, we don't know what the specific conditions were, but 38 years of being in this condition coming for who knows how long to the side of this pool, hoping against hope that when those waters stir, that he can somehow, here's the irony, he's an invalid, but that he could somehow be at the front of the line and get into the water before everybody else. 38 years. You think about pain in your life, and when you feel pain, how it can seem like an eternity, like one hour, one day, one week, one month, one year. It's like excruciating when it comes to the passing of time when we're in pain. And we realize, we see that this guy has been an invalid in this condition, in that cultural moment, for 38 years, utterly dependent on everybody else. But here's the question. Here's the question when it comes to experiencing transformation in our lives. Here is the question that you need to honestly answer to experience any change, any transformation, any growth, any overcoming in your life. And it plays out like this. Because we read, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want, do you, do you want to get well? Now we realize 
This is Jesus, right? This is Jesus. But it's hard not to respond like, well, duh. Like, what do you think this guy wants? What do you think he's been laying by this pool floor, you know, for however long, hoping against hope that he would be the first person in the waters when they're stirred? So what do you mean does he want to get well? But there's another chapter. There is another side of this story that the chances are really good that all of us are familiar with as well. For instance, this is how the guy responds to Jesus' question. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, somebody else goes down ahead of me. You know, he's an invalid. He's like, ah, yeah, I get that. Somebody else gets into the pool before I can get into the pool, and I just sit here longing, hoping against hope, that I can one day get to the front of the line, and I could get well. Now, at first glance, um, it's hard not to feel sympathy for this guy, right? It's hard not to recognize his condition and just think, man, if I was in that condition, how badly I would want to be at the front of the line. How badly, you know, with the pain in my life, I would want to be healed and I would want to get well. But there's something deeper that's going on in this experience that has to do with his desire and his experience of actually getting well. See, what he's really saying to Jesus when Jesus asks him, do you want to get well? What he's really saying is, but I've got a plan. I I've got a strategy. I've got this way that I think in my head that if I could just execute it, and if I could get somebody else to help me with it, then I would get well. Now just remember, this is Jesus in front of them asking him, do you want to get well? But what is he doing? He's going about my plan. About my plan. Really when it comes down to it, he's making an excuse for why he is in the condition that he is in. If somebody would just help me, and it's like, dude, the God of heaven is standing in front of you, and he is ready to make you well. But this guy is just fixated on his strategy and his plan as the only solution that's going to help him get well. See, we look at his condition, I think, on one hand, and we say, 38 years of being an invalid, 38 years of being in pain, in that cultural moment to be in his condition meant that you were dependent on someone else for everything. There was nothing that you could do for yourself. You want me to be more graphic? Um, he's pooping on his mat all day long, right? And he's laying in it. I mean, this is how desperate this guy's situation is. You would think, you know, we look at him and we go, surely you'd want to get well. Surely you would jump at any solution to deal with this issue in your life. And I think sometimes we feel that when we look at other people's lives. We look at what they're experiencing, what the pain is, what the problem is in their life, and we think, dude, you know, if you would only deal with this, if you would only take this, accept this solution, then everything would be fine. But what about this scenario? 38 years in this condition, and it's the only condition I know. 38 years with being comfortable, with being uncomfortable. I know this life. I don't know what change requires from me. I don't know what it would mean for my life to actually change because this life, as bad as this life may be, it is the life that I am used to. So when you ask me the question, do you really want to change? I'm like, oh, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure how to answer that question. Do you really want to get well? You know, when it comes to getting well, when it comes to overcoming addiction, uh, when it comes to uh, improving a relationship, 
when it comes to dealing with the pain in our lives, the want to, always needs to precede the how to. The want to. Do you want to? The want to is the question you need to ask and honestly answer yourself because the want to always precedes the how to. Do you want to? And one of the greatest barriers to change and growth in our life are what? Excuses? You know, if only, if only, if only, oh, if only someone would come and help me in my situation, then it would be different. If only this situation in my life hadn't happened like that, if only this person hadn't done that to me, if only this partner that I have would be different. Excuses and blame are these two obstacles and these two barriers that come right into the midst of the reality of experiencing change and growth and transformation and overcoming in our lives. Which brings us back to this question of Jesus. And that is this. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Do you want to change? Actually, honestly, I'm not really sure. You know, I love how Brene Brown puts this when she talks about pain management strategies in our lives. And she says that one of the primary pain management strategy, strategies is, is what is called numbing. You know, we try to deal with our pain by numbing. And one of the universal strategies of numbing is called this, crazy busy. Huh? It's like an epidemic in North America. If I just keep busy enough, then actually I don't have time to look at, to pay attention to the pain that is a part of my life. Or it might be a bottle of wine or a six pack of beer, you know, at the end of the day. And it's like, it just, it just keeps me numb to the pain that I'm feeling. And it's my way of coping and it's my way of soothing in response to whatever is going on in my life. It's, it's how I cope. You know, it's interesting this, this last week, uh, medication as well, and I mean prescription medication, but it's interesting this last week I was reading and discovered that the leading cause of death now in North America, it's not car accidents. It's actually medication. And it is now said that more people die from prescription drug overdoses than heroin, cocaine, and meth use combined. Prescription medication. So what are we doing? We, I have this pain in my life, but I'm not dealing with the pain. I'm trying to numb myself. I'm trying to numb myself to the pain. And Brene Brown says this. She says, I wanted help living like this. I wanted help living like this, not solutions, not solutions to stop living like this. You see the difference? Give me some help so I continue living this life. I want to live it a little better. I want my life to be a little bit different. Give me help to live this life, not to stop living this life. Help in living this life is not change, is not transformation. Christine Kane, uh, she says it from a different perspective, and she says we can sometimes get so comfortable with our misery that we believe that there will never be something better. If we get comfortable in our misery, then we stop wanting to change. We stop wanting to change for the better. Now, I want to recognize, I want to recognize with you that uh, this next part, this next chapter of the story, if you will, it's kind of weird, and I just want to stop and I want to say to you, I realize it's kind of weird, but what's going on here just helps us to see how to have application to what this guy is experiencing and how to deal and process change in our lives. Because this is how the story goes. We read that Jesus said to him, get up, 
pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. I, I don't know, you know, did he feel it? There's some kind of tingle in his body. Something felt different. He could wiggle his toes. I don't know. But Jesus said this. He like pronounced this healing on him. And then it says, at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. And then we read the day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you from carrying your mat. It's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. And so they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? And the man who was healed had no idea for who it was. For Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Now this is kind of fascinating because it's almost like the healing of this guy. You think what a significant event it was for him. But the healing of this guy plays out against the, the backdrop in a sense. A footnote against the backdrop of a much bigger story. And it's like Jesus just looks at the guy. You know, he asks him this question. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? And the guy's like, well, you know, I've been laying here for this many years. And, you know, nobody will help me get it. And Jesus is almost like, oy vey. Like, you're healed, right? You're healed. Like, I, forget your excuses. Forget your blame. Dude, you're healed. Get up. Take your mat and walk. And this guy does. He gets up and he starts to walk. But you see what Jesus does. It's like Jesus takes him and he puts him into this highly charged, explosive situation. Because for the Jews, you know, all this talk about the Sabbath, they had 39 laws. 39 laws about what you could and you couldn't do on the Sabbath. And this was not a, this was not a Lululemon yoga mat kind of friendly culture, okay? Uh, at least on the Sabbath, because it's like one of the rules was you cannot carry your yoga mat on the Sabbath. And so here's this guy, and he has the police come after him saying, how dare you carry your mat? It's the Sabbath. Now look what happened next. Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. You are well again. Stop, notice, sinning. Or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Now, I'm sure all of us are familiar with something called a, a, a victim mentality, right? A, a victim mentality is a guy who's been an invalid uh, for 38 years and who continues to say, if, if only someone would help me with my strategy, with, with my plan, then maybe I'd have a hope of getting well. A victim mentality is being in a relationship and going, oh, this is going nowhere. Or going, this is really painful. But if, if this bozo would only face their stuff, you know, only deal with their, then our relationship would have a chance of, of getting better. Then there would be hope for our relationship. A, a victim mentality is saying, you know, uh, when I feel overwhelmed, when I feel stressed, when I feel anxiety, when I feel pain, my go-to, my comfort, my soothing is to grab a hold of this. You know, you fill in the blank, whatever it is for you, to grab a hold of this. And I know it's not healthy in my life, but, but it's the only way that I, can seem, that I can seem to make it through the day. And so we might think to ourselves, you know, when Jesus says... Uh, because we love to hear this, huh? Stop sinning. When Jesus says stop sinning, we're like, Jesus, it's not very sensitive. Come on, this guy's been an invalid for 38 years. Like, who of us like someone to say, stop, stop sinning? But you see what Jesus is doing here? He's saying to this guy, you know what? I healed your body, but you're not all clean. I healed your body. But you're still going through life like a victim. I healed your body, but you're still coming up with all of the excuses and all of the blame. 
It's like for the first time in 38 years, you got off the mat that was carrying you, and you are carrying your mat. And all you can do when you are asked and questioned about why are you carrying your mat is to go, it was Jesus. It's his fault. He healed me. Right? Go after Jesus. And this is so significant and powerful in terms of helping us understand why this fifth step of recovery is so important. Because we are told that our greatest needs as humans are what? Love and belonging. What do you need? What do you need? You need to be loved. You need to know that you belong. That is both the source and the answer to our pain. The, the source of our pain, because when we don't experience love, when, when we don't know that, yes, truly, we are loved, when, when we don't have a sense of, of belonging, like these are our people, this is our place, it generates incredible pain in our lives. But again, it is the answer to our pain, because when we know that we are loved, when we know that, that we belong, we can endure. We can endure incredible pain because of that experience of love and belonging in our lives. And this is exactly why the experience of this invalid guy's encounter with Jesus is so amazing. You know, it's so funny sometimes, funny, so amazing. <laughs> looking at these experiences that Jesus had with people. Because, you know, we read this story and we go, wow, the guy's an invalid for 38 years, boom, Jesus heals him and it's all good. But this isn't Walt Disney. We actually don't know the end of this guy's story. All we know is this, that Jesus healed the guy. Can you imagine after 38 years of laying on a mat, pooping on your mat, sorry, um, suddenly you're walking around on your legs. And what does this guy do? Like, get this. Jesus reveals who he is. Jesus heals the guy and says, hey, I'm Jesus. I'm the God of heaven who brought this healing about in your life. And what does the guy do? He goes and wraps him up to the gospel, right? He turns around and says, hey, don't blame me. It's Jesus who did this to me. He's the reason that I'm carrying my yoga mat on the Sabbath. Quit pointing the finger at me. Let me try and bring this together like this. Imagine, imagine that you know this guy. Maybe you're even the person that, you know, day after day, you, you drop him off. That's the picture I have is that he's lying at this pool of Bethesda all day. You, you drop him off. At the end of the day, you, you pick him up. But on this day, you make your way to the pool, you know, not looking forward to the job of cleanup that you're going to have to do. And all of a sudden, you cannot believe your eyes. Because no longer is this guy on the mat that's been carrying him for 38 years. He's carrying the mat. He is walking on his own two legs. And this friend of yours, he comes up to you, and you're just like in complete disbelief, and he says to you, you can't believe what happened. And you're like, dude, you're walking on your legs. But when he says you can't believe what you're happening, what happened? It's like, Jesus did this to me. And you're like, yeah, I did this amazing. No, Jesus did this to me. He made me pick up my mat, and now all of the religious police are after me and blaming me. And you're like, what? Dude. You have got to be kidding me. The God of heaven looked at you. The God of heaven took the initiative and came to you. The God of heaven healed you. You didn't ask for it. You didn't even look for it. You didn't respond, Jesus, yes, I want you to heal me. Dude, your life is a mess. And yet this is how love and how much the God of heaven wants you 
to belong to him and know that you were created to be a part of, of his family. And as an expression of that love and that belonging that God wants for you, he lays his hand on you and heals your life. Can I encourage you? That that would not only be the expression that you make to your friend, but it would be the words that you constantly say to yourself. That in Jesus and through Jesus, you are loved and you belong. And the greatest expression of that love and belonging is the God that stretched his arms out on the cross and said, I give my perfect life for you. Not because you're perfect, not because your life was so great that you somehow caught my eye and drew my attention. I know all the messes in your life, but I loved you anyway. And I'm desperate for you to know that you belong in my family. Let me encourage you this morning. Allow that truth to be your motivation to be your, assur uh, your assurance to take this fifth step, to voluntarily submit to any and all changes God wants to make in my life and humbly ask him to remove my character defect. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you that you see us as, you are, as we are, that you know us as we are. Warts and all, uh, sin and all. And that you come into our lives to communicate to us the extent of your love, of a family and a love that you long for us to find belonging in. I thank you this morning for the first time or maybe for the 50th time, we can say to you, Jesus, thank you that you are the Savior, that you are the rescuer. I put my trust and I put my hope in you, asking you to be the savior and the leader of my life. And I voluntarily submit myself to you and to the changes for good that I know that you want to make in me. I ask this in Jesus' name.